everyone. How are you doing? It's been so long since we've been able to see each other's faces, but rest assured, we are a family and we're praying for each other. We are excited for when this national emergency passes and we'll be able to join together again, worshiping as one. But in the meantime, know that the church is just a building. You can praise God no matter where you're at. Take a moment to just give him praise right now because he truly deserves it. So let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for this time of turmoil. Lord, not because we enjoy what we are going through, but because in this time of turmoil in our nation and around the world, you have been on the move. Many things are happening because of this. Lord, people are together in a different way. Lord, we are using a technology that we did not think we were able to use in order to share the gospel. And it's only because you put us in this position, Lord. We are reaching, the church is reaching more people around the world through putting our services live on the internet than we were doing before. People that can't get to church, people that are afraid to enter because the last time they went, they were hurt people who don't quite know what the Pentecostal experience is. It doesn't matter what the issue is, Lord. They are finding a way to attend church via the internet in a personal setting where they can get alone with you, God. So we thank you for this opportunity, Lord. We thank you in it because we know on the other end, you are stretching and growing the church. Tonight, we just say thank you. Bless you, almighty Lord, in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. He is truly doing some great things, is he not? Let's just begin in our Gospel of Mark study. We're in our third lesson, and the Gospel of Mark is just so packed full of good information. It's going to take us about 10 or 11 times to get through this, but that's okay because every week we learn a little bit more. So this week, I I want to talk to you about discipleship. When was the last time you made a decision that you knew would impact the rest of your life? How did you feel in that moment? This week, we're going to look at the life-changing decision with the call of discipleship. What does it mean to really follow Jesus? This isn't a casual decision. It's a life-changing one. It's not about following him in your heart, but truly truly following Jesus. It means so much more. Let that sink into your spirit, following Jesus, because there's a huge difference between the casual thought of following Jesus and making the life-altering decision to be his disciple and follow him. Pay close attention to what Jesus does, because we're supposed to be doing that same thing. 
So this week through the written word in the gospel of Mark, we want you to do a couple of things. We want you to understand that true discipleship requires a relationship with Jesus Christ. Outside of that relationship, you are not a disciple of Christ. We want you to feel motivated toward obedience out of love for Jesus, not out of guilt for our sin. And surrender every aspect of your life to the Holy Spirit's transforming work. Let's watch another video by Francis Chan while he's in the city of Capernaum. I hope you enjoy this. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. Okay, right now, I am in that synagogue. This is where Jesus taught in Capernaum. And you have to understand this scene. I mean, this is, this is Jesus, the Son of God, who, who not only became flesh, but now he starts to teach. And he starts teaching with authority right here. He comes to the synagogue and, and his, his message, it says in the beginning of the passage for this week, is the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Okay, this is what Jesus starts off saying is it's time. So imagine the son of God comes down on the earth, takes on flesh and goes, it's time. Here we go. You've been waiting. They've been waiting for the Messiah. They've been waiting to hear the truth about God's kingdom. Remember, there's been silence for about 400 years since the time of Malachi. And now Jesus comes on the scene and says, the time is now. And his message is the kingdom of God is at hand. He's like, I'm about to explain to you God's kingdom, not this world's kingdom, not anything you've been taught before, but I came here to tell you about the kingdom of God. And he says, it's time to repent. It's time to turn from whatever way you were living and to start following me. And right then is when he starts calling the disciples and he calls his first disciples, which you've got to understand, that's an amazing thought to be called by the son of God. And he just looks at these disciples and he says, follow me. He tells Simon and Andrew, follow me. So, uh, Peter's house is right up the street. I mean, I can see it from here, from the synagogue. And he's telling them, follow me. It's huge. He's not saying follow some doctrine or just follow this, this code of morality or these laws. He's saying, follow me, the person. So he immediately just comes with authority, tells people, follow me, which is an incredible honor when you think about it. You, you, you know, nowadays we, we talk about God's calling, like, oh, I feel like God's calling me to this. I feel like he's calling, like, there's none of that. It's just, this is huge. God became flesh and actually went after people, individuals. And this was a rare thing. I mean, a rabbi never called disciples. It was, it was the people that would run and flock to the teacher, to the rabbi, but this was different. Like Jesus knew exactly who he was calling, tells them, follow me. And he says, and I'm gonna make you fishers of men. And it says what these guys did was immediately they left their nets and followed him. So they dropped everything they were doing and said, I'm gonna go, you know, Again, we talk about God's calling, like God may be calling me to this or that. And that's, that's, that's not the way that, hey, as we go to these different places in Israel, I, I, I'm hoping that you see something like so concrete, so physical, like, you know, nowadays we just kind of go, oh, I think the Lord's calling me in my heart. 
I think, uh, you know, I've given my heart to him. Like, it, it was a lot more substantial than that. It wasn't this obscure, vague following him. When he told, you know, when he told them, hey, follow me, they literally dropped everything and they start walking with him. Okay, it wasn't like, okay, I'll follow you in my heart or I'll pray a prayer and receive you. No, I am literally gonna get up and follow you. And that's what they did. And he says, and I'm gonna make you fishers of men. Immediately called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. A lot of times when I talk to people about what they believe God may be calling them to, they say, we talk about it almost like we secretly hope he doesn't call us to anything because we kind of like our life the way it is and we act like he's an interruption, which he is. It's like, how do I fit in his calling into everything I want? And the answer to that is you don't. You do what they did. They just left because they understand who they were going to. Man, even, even in part they understood at this point. And then Jesus continues on in Capernaum, the city that I'm in right now. And he went and it says that as he was teaching, the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. So when Jesus came into this synagogue, he starts teaching and everyone's like, We've never heard anything like this. He's got an authority like no one else. And you've got to understand, like the Bible says, like in Isaiah 55, like his thoughts are so far beyond our thoughts. He was like the, the heavens are above the earth. That's how much higher his thoughts are. And so when Jesus comes and teaches and his word, his word comes out, we have to treat it as so much higher. Like they got it. He taught like no one else and this book has an authority that I don't have, no one on the earth. It doesn't matter how popular you are, this or that. He says, look, here's the authority. And Jesus taught with this authority. People knew it because then he starts healing people. Like in this synagogue comes this person who has this unclean spirit in him. And Jesus immediately says, be silent and come out of him and suddenly this guy falls and he starts convulsing out of his mouth and this demon leaves him and again the people are saying who is this what is this a new teaching with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him and then he goes right up the street where 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 peter's uh, mother-in-law is sick and he heals her he heals her and she starts serving him. And then it says like at that evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door and he healed many who were sick. This is like a real thing. Like imagine living here, having your life and you hear about what happened in the synagogue. We've never seen anything like this. This person came in today and he cast out a demon. Then he walked across the street and he healed Peter's mother-in-law. And so then the whole city, the entire city is at the door. And because they, they've they never seen anything like this. And, and he starts healing everyone. People are coming to him from every quarter. This, this leper comes kneeling and, and, and saying, please, you know, and Jesus, it says, moved with pity, stretched out his hand and touched him. Got to understand, this is like, we, we, we talked about Jesus coming onto the scene, God becoming flesh, but now he's calling people to himself. And he's coming with this authority saying, follow me. The kingdom of heaven, this is something completely new. Follow me. Turn from everything you were doing. This is so much bigger. This is so much bigger. And I hope you see that, 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 that we, we've got to stop casually going, oh, I think the Lord may be calling. And saying, are you kidding me? The son of God has something for me to do. I'll drop everything and go because everyone is flocking to him. And the thought that of that whole mass of people in that city, he calls out a few individuals and he says, follow me. I hope you don't see him as just some sort of interruption, but you just go, are you kidding me? He actually calls people today. God himself became 
flesh and called me to do something. And today his Holy Spirit calls some of us on this task. I hope you understand the power of this man, the authority of this person. And you just go, man, I'll do anything to follow him. Welcome back from that video. Well, let's talk about discipleship. Jesus called four disciples in this first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. But we looked at we looked at the first 13 verses in the first chapter of Mark last week. This week we're going to read from 14th verse all the way to the end to verse 45. So we're going to cover a lot of territory tonight. So with verse 14, it starts out by saying, now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. So what we have here is we know that John was put into prison. Now it doesn't stop and tell us that story right here, but it does in Mark chapter six, and you can find it in other places in the gospels. But there's a detailed description of John's fate in prison in Mark chapter 6, starting at verse 17. But it's, we'll talk about that later because it's not important to what we're doing today. Then it says, Jesus came into Galilee. Jesus spent most of his time in the region of Galilee usually only going up to Jerusalem for the appointed feasts. And Galilee was a large populated area north of Judea and Jerusalem. Last week, I told you that it was not a, a great area. It was a spiritually dark area. Um, Jews and Gentiles lived together, though usually in their own cities, one on one side of the Galilee and one on the other side of the Galilee. It was not a small backwater region. Please understand this. According to Jewish historian Josephus, Galilee was an area of about 30 by 60 miles, and it had 204 villages with none less than 15,000 people in each one of those villages. This means there were more than 3 million people in the extended region of Galilee. That's a lot of people that Jesus was reaching out to. Then we go on to say, it says, when Jesus came into Galilee, he was preaching the gospel of God. What was Jesus doing? He was preaching the gospel of God. Jesus was a preacher and he brought the message of God's rule on earth. Great message, though his message was not brought in the manner that was popularly expected or desired. Most people wanted a political ruler. They wanted that political kingdom that would replace the oppressive Romans. Um, they thought Jesus or the Messiah was going to come and overthrow them. They weren't expecting the Messiah as Jesus came. So contrary to expect, ex expectations of most people in his day, Jesus brought a kingdom of love, not subjugation. He brought a, a message of grace and not law. He brought a message of humility and not pride. His message was for all men, not just for the Jews. And his message he meant to be received freely by man not imposed by force. He did things completely different than the Messiah that they were expecting to come on the scene. So through the rest of this chapter um, and the Gospel of Mark, it stresses the work of Jesus more so than the words. We talked about that in our first lesson. But with this opening statement in chapter 1, verse 14, Mark reminds us that the focus of Jesus's ministry was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Jesus was a preacher who did wonderful miracles, not a miracle worker who sometimes preached. Let's go on in verse 15. It says, these are Jesus's words. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So he said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. When Jesus preached the kingdom of God, he wanted people to know that it was near, as close as your hand. How many of them could reach out and touch the Savior? His kingdom, the kingdom of God, was at hand. 
It wasn't distance. It wasn't this dreamy kingdom that they had blown up in their mind. It wasn't what they imagined. But it was now the time to encounter the kingdom of God through Christ in the flesh. There are two ancient words in Greek that can be translated as time. One is chronos. We get the word chronological from that, and it simply means chronological time. One o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, January, February, March, each year. It's chronological time. The other word is kairos, meaning the strategic opportunity or the decisive time. This is the word kairos that Jesus used when he said the time is fulfilled. What he was saying when he said this was the strategic time for the kingdom of God is now. Now is your time of opportunity. So don't let it pass by. It was the strategic time. Christ came at just the right time. He also said repent in his message. So when Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom of God, he wanted people to know that entering the kingdom was different. He wanted them to know what it was like. They could not enter the kingdom by going the same way that they were going before. They couldn't do it that way. They had to change their direction and experience the kingdom of God. They had to completely turn around because they were going the wrong way. So he was telling them, I'm at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand and turn around because you're not going the right way. You won't find it the way that you're going. See, a lot of people think that repentance is about your feelings. It's about feeling sorry for your sins. And we should. It's a wonderful thing to feel sorry about your sin because that leads to different behavior. But repent is not a feelings word. Repent is an action word. Jesus told us to make a change of mind, not merely to feel sorry for what we've done in the past. Repentance speaks of a change of direction, not a sorrow in your heart. So yes, you can be sorry, but repentance isn't about just sorrow. There's an action that is involved in it. You can say, I'm sorry, but how you behave truly shows whether that sorrow is real or not. Repent is an action word. It doesn't describe something that we do before we come to God. That's not what it's about. Um, repentance is like saying, um, I'm going to go from here to there. Um, you have to, in order to go into my living room, I have to leave my dining room. So in order to go someplace, you have to leave to go to another. We can't come to the kingdom of God unless we leave our sin behind and enter into a new life where Christ is the one who leads us. It's a complete different turnaround. You have to leave something in order to get there. And that's what Jesus was saying. If you want to enter the kingdom of God, you have to turn yourself around. You're not finding it the way you're going. Leave what you have done in the past and come into the kingdom of God. And then Jesus went on and said, believe. When Jesus preached the kingdom of the uh, uh, the preached the the message of the gospel of the kingdom of God, he wanted people to know what it was like to live in the kingdom. The kingdom Jesus preached was not just about moral rewards. It was about trusting God, taking him at his word and living a relationship of dependence on him. The ancient Greek word that Jesus used for believe is pastio which means much more than knowledge or agreement in the mind. It speaks of a relationship of trust and dependence. You see, there are many people who believe the gospel, but they do not believe in it. Read that verse again. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. When you are in a relationship, when you are in your house, when you are in your car, you're surrounded by that, right? When you're in your house, what you have in there is familiar. You take care of it. It protects you. It means something to you. When you are in a relationship with Christ, the same thing happens. You are surrounded by his love. He protects you with the walls that he places around you. It means something when you are in Christ. And when, when Jesus said in here, believe in, 
the gospel. Believe in the good news. He was not saying believe the good news, but believe in it. It was not, it was an appeal to not only accept it as an intellectual accurate statement because it was, but he was saying to rest in this truth, to repose in it. It was a call to let the, the heart find ease in knowing Jesus, believe in the gospel. You can believe in a lot of things. You can believe things that you see and you can believe things that you hear. But Jesus is telling us we must believe in the gospel. As we go on, we now are coming in verse 16 to when Jesus called the disciples. So it says here, as he was going along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon. Simon, we know as Peter. The brother of Simon, Andrew and Simon were brothers, Andrew and Peter. They were casting a net in the sea for they were fishermen. They were fishermen. So what I want you to understand that this was not the first time Jesus had met this group of men. You can go to John chapter one, verse 35 and read on from there. And it describes the first time that Jesus met these men. In fact, it's the story where Nathaniel, when Jesus told Nathaniel, um, I saw you sitting under the tree and it made Nathaniel believe in Jesus. And Nathaniel was the one that said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So Jesus had encountered these men before. Um, they were fishermen. They were common men, men without theological credentials or status in the world. Jesus met them as they labored as common men. And he chose these disciples, not for who they were, but for what he could do through them. There are some great traits and good qualities of a fisherman that Jesus can use. And I want you to think of these because this is what he's calling you to do. These are the traits of a good disciple. And these were the traits that the fishermen had back in that day. And even today, they would make these traits would make a successful ministry because one fishermen had to have courage. They had to have an ability to work together. They were not. One, they had to work together to grab those nets and to know where they were going and to row those boats. They had to have patience and wait. They had to have energy and stamina. That was a lot of work. Fishing in the way that they did at that time was not simply throwing your fishing line and waiting. There had to be stamina and patience as they waited on what they were going to get. They had to have faith that they were in the right place and would, in fact, catch fish. And they had to have tenacity. They had to have stick to itiveness. Professional fishermen simply cannot afford to be quitters or complainers. And so Jesus uses these same traits for us today. We as ministers and sharing the gospel with the world, we as Christ's ambassadors, we have to have these same traits. We have to have courage to share the gospel. We have to have the ability to work together. We know that Paul called us to unity in the church. We have to have patience with people and with each other. We have to have the energy to get the work done and stamina to stick to it. We have to have faith that what we are doing is going to reap a reward. And we have to have tenacity. Don't give up. That's what Jesus saw in these fishermen. And that's what he sees in you as a messenger for the kingdom of God. And in verse 17, Jesus said to these he said to Andrew and Peter, who is called Simon here, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. By saying follow me, Jesus tells us what Christianity is all about in those simple words. It's about following Jesus. Simple. At its root, Christianity is not about theological systems, rules, or even helping people. It's simply about following Jesus. Just by the fact that he is saying, follow me, he's indicating he's superior and they are inferior. This is not to say a prideful statement by Jesus saying this, but the truth of the matter was he was the son of God come in the flesh to the earth and he was superior. And by following behind him, we are inferior to the one that we are following. And until we humble ourselves to recognize that, we cannot be good disciples. Of Christ. When Jesus said, I will make you become, 
fishers of men. He was indicating that he would make them. They weren't yet fishers of men, but he was going to make them become fishers of men. That's a promise. That's a promise to each and every one of us. Maybe you're not where you think you should be in Christ. But remember, Jesus said he would make us fishers of men. Hmm. If these men received something wonderful in following Jesus, it was only right for them to give it to others. And it's only right for you to share it with others, too, so that we can catch men and women and children, old people and young people, all races, in order for us to catch those people into the kingdom of God. He shared something wonderful with us through these gospels, through his life, through the works and the words that he did. We are responsible for sharing it and making fishers and becoming fishers of men. When he did this, when he called them to be fishers of men, as he calls us to become fishers of men, he called them to do what he did. He was the greatest fisherman of all time. But he wanted others to do the work that he did. First, these four. Because after he called Peter or Andrew and Peter, he called the two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Let's talk about that a little bit. In, um, we, we see in verse 18 the response of Peter and Andrew. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And here was the response. Immediately, remember, this comes 40 times in the Gospel of Mark. Immediately, they left their nets and they followed him. It was an immediate response. Not because they'd never heard the message before. Remember, they had met Jesus before. He already had a reputation and they wanted to be with him. It may have originally been because they thought that he was going to overthrow the Roman kingdom. But nevertheless, they didn't just drop everything and follow him willy nilly. They had already known who Jesus was and they were comfortable in knowing that he was doing something different. And it goes on to say, in verse 19, going on a little further, Jesus saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending the nets. What does that mean? Mending the nets. This is important, and I hope you can catch this. Mark's term, mending the nets, it, it means to put in proper order or to make ready. And it includes the cleansing, mending, and folding the nets in preparation for the next evening's fishing. Mending, cleaning, folding. What a wonderful picture of God. What a wonderful picture of the work that Jesus does. He cleanses us. He folds us, mending us together, taking the broken pieces and mending them back into what he wants us to be. He folds us together in preparation for what he has called us to do. This is similar. This word is a derivative of the same word that is used in Ephesians 4, chapter 12, where Paul describes the work of equipping the saints. Um, a Strong's definition relates to this. It's to equip. Therefore, it means to complete thoroughly, to repair or to adjust. That's what God, God does for us. He fits us. He frames us. He mends us. He makes us perfect to join us together to prepare and to restore. All that from the words, mending their nets. Jesus catches you while you're still mending your nets. You're trying to do it on your own. But when you follow Jesus, he cleanses you. He mends you and picks up the broken pieces. And he equips you to become fishers of men. When he called them, it says in verse 20, immediately he called them and they left the father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants. And they went away to follow Jesus. Jesus had a reputation. And these four men, and eventually 12, changed the world when Jesus called them. Then the next thing, we have a change of uh, scenery. In verse 21, it says, They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. Capernaum. That's what you are seeing in the video from Francis Chan. That is a beautiful place. In 2015, when we went to Israel, we got to see that. Um, Holly and Bert, Marty, uh, Georgia Brogan, Pastor um, Ruthie and Sean, 
we got to see those places and it was beautiful in Capernaum. But it says here, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath. So when you can go into Capernaum today, you see the remains of that Jewish synagogue, which still has the foundations of the same building that Jesus taught in. Imagine that you're standing in the same place that Jesus taught where he cast out a demon. We got the privilege of standing there. It is awesome to walk where Jesus walked. You can do that today where you're sitting, where you're standing and where you're going. But it says then, immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. Typically, the synagogue had no set teachers. This was not the, the temple in Jerusalem. This was the synagogue. Instead, they had the custom of the freedom of the synagogue where uh, somebody who is a learned guest, they were invited to speak on the scripture, reading that for the day. And this custom gave Jesus an opportunity to teach. And teaching he did. And it goes on to say, they were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Wow. They were astonished at his teaching. We are not told what Jesus taught, but we are told the effect that his teaching had on his audience. They had never heard anyone teach quite like this before. Have you ever sat in a, in a service where the message was going out and you just felt that message was just about you? just about you. Many times that preacher or that teacher doesn't know what you're specifically going through, but God does. And he gives them a message so that it can pierce through everything and touch your soul. And that's what was happening when Jesus was preaching the world. He, board, he was bringing it alive. And so they thought this is somebody who preaches with authority, not as the scribes who just read it and then comment on it. But Jesus gave the word power because he is the word. So they were astonished at what he taught. Um, the scribes of Jesus' day rarely taught boldly. They were quiet. They would quote a variety of the rabbis and interpreters. But Jesus was bold in how he taught. Why? Why did Jesus teach with authority? It's really simple. Because he had authority. He brought a divine message and was confident that it came from God. He wasn't quoting from man when he read the scripture. He was quoting directly from God. Jesus taught with authority because he knew what he was talking about. You can't teach with authority if you aren't familiar with the material. Jesus taught with authority because he believed in what he taught. When you believe what you teach, it comes through to your audience with authority. We first saw the submitted Jesus in the first part of the Gospel of Mark. Up to verse 14, we saw a submitted Jesus. He was submitted to the Father in baptism. He submitted to the Holy Spirit in going out into the wilderness. Now we see the authority of Jesus because authority flows from submission. Did you catch that? That's a very important thing to understand. Authority flows from submission. We aren't safe with real authority from God unless we are also submitted to God. Jesus showed his authority when he was with the wild beasts in the wilderness. Jesus showed his authority when the angels ministered to him. Jesus showed his authority when he announced the presence of the kingdom of God and commanded men to repent and believe. Jesus showed authority when he called disciples to follow him. And we're going to find throughout the Gospels, Jesus showed many striking displays of the authority that he was given from God. Thank, thank him, because without his authority, this message would be foolish. There would be no reason to believe and to repent. Now the scenery changes again. They're still in the same place. They're still in the synagogue on Sunday. And it says, in verse 23, just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, he, the young man with the unclean spirit, saying, what business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. We know that this man was demon possessed. 
Mark used the same grammar that Paul used to describe the Christian being in Christ. This unclean spirit was in this man. You are either in Christ or you're not. So you are either infilled and indwelled by the Holy Spirit or you're infilled and indwelt with something other than from God. This unclean spirit was the evil Lord over this man's poor life. But our Lord over our life, we should be in Christ. The similarity in the wording between a Christian having Jesus and this man having a demon demonstrates that he is in us and we are in him. We are Jesus possessed in the right sense because he is in He's filling us and he's influencing us for good. This man was different. Even as Jesus can live in us, so one uninhabited by Jesus can be inhabited by a demon if the invitation is extended, either consciously or unconsciously. You know that you must invite a demon in. That's very hard for people to understand how you behave, what you allow in your life gives permission for that demon to enter. When somebody knocks on your door, you have to give them permission to enter. Otherwise, they cannot come in. Jesus knocks on the door of your heart and you have to let him in. But so does the enemy. He knocks on your door. Exposure to things like spiritualism, uh, Ouija boards, um, astrology, the occult, drugs, alcohol, um, all of those are dangerous and they open up your mind to receive demonic possession. They are the opening and the permission that you give to the enemy to creep in. These can be things like the music that you listen to when it's filled with filth and, and talks about evil. Maybe it's the movies that you watch, the movies of horror and blood and, and selfishness and, and vulgarity, uh, so many things that you can watch on TV can get into your spirit and it allows permission for a demon to come in. Maybe it's the company that you keep, um, the things that you smoke, the drugs that you take. It is your lifestyle. You're either in Christ and leading a life that shows Christ is in you or you don't. And when you invite a demon in, things are going to change. But when you invite Jesus into your life, things are going to change. I would rather be filled with the Holy Spirit any day than allow a demon from hell to tell me what I can and cannot do. So it's better that you leave the doors to the demonic world shut. I'm going to tell you a story about my granddaughter, Alexis. This is when I lived in Kansas. I was working at Fort Riley and I had just bought a new house and had it built on um, Lake Milford down in Kansas. And we were sitting at the, the kitchen island area. And Alexis and Mariah, my two oldest granddaughters, were maybe four and three years old, and they were coloring a picture. Um, they were sitting next, they were on these stools, and next to us was the refrigerator, and I was doing something um, near the refrigerator, and Alexis, just out of the blue, said to me, Grandma, why do they call the devil a snake? And my back was to her, and the whole time I was getting some ice out of the water dispenser of my refrigerator, and I remember saying to God, Lord, how do I describe this to a a young girl of this age. Give me the words to say. And before I had a chance to say anything, as I was turning around, Alexis looked at me and she said, never mind, grandma. The angel that's standing here told me to quit talking about the devil. And I just about fell out of my shoes. That was a wonderful presence of God that day, speaking directly to my granddaughter, telling her the more time you spend dwelling on the devil, the more the devil is going to have a hold of your life. What wise words she was given when she said, never mind, the angel told me not to talk about the devil anymore. So God will tell you when you spend time with him, when you are immersed in him, he will give you what you need. He will lead you and guide you. That is a beautiful thing that God did through my granddaughter and I'll never forget it. This demon, when Jesus was speaking to him, said, I know who you are. O oh, Holy One of God, this demon testified that Jesus was the Son of God. The demon testified to it. See, this demon and all other demons had to admit that Jesus, while he was in the wilderness, failed 
They failed to corrupt Jesus because these demons, remember we talked last week about he was being tested. It was a constant state of temptation, not a one and go, a one and go and a one and go. He was in a constant state of temptation. And so these demons had to admit now that that wilderness experience conquered them because they said, this demon said, you are the Holy One of God. Even the dem- demons believe and quake. They knew who Jesus was. But Jesus rebukes this spirit. He rebukes him and he said, be quiet and come out of him. Very simple words. Jesus rebuked him. When Jesus rebuked him, he didn't have to rely on hocus pocus or ceremonies. He simply demonstrated the authority of God. Jesus said, be quiet. Jesus often told demons to shut up. Today, many self-styled deliverers uh, or exorcisms or uh, people that try to deliver um, others from demon possession, they encourage the demons to speak or even believe what these demons say. Why would you want them to speak? They lie. Who cares what they call themselves? Who care what they say? It doesn't matter. They lie. It's just as well that you tell them to get out and go straight back to hell. Don't worry about what a demon says. There's no truth in them. But what Jesus did, he avoided those theatrics and merely delivered the afflicted man by saying to this demon, be quiet and come out of him. So simple. Be quiet and come out of him. There were other exorcists in Jesus' day. He was not the only one who tried to cast out demons. The difference was he did cast out demons. There was a huge difference between Jesus and other exorcists of his time. These other exorcists, they used long, fancy, elaborate, superstitious ceremonies, and they most often failed. Jesus never failed to cast out a demon, and he never used an elaborate ceremony. There's a, 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 this is in the book of Josephus. There's an account in the book of Josephus about the work of the ancient exorcist called Eleazar. uh, Josephus is a Jewish historian. I have the the book sitting right over here beside me. And Eleazar was around in the time of Jesus. And Josephus words it this way. He put to the nose of the possessed man a ring, which had under its seal one of the roots prescribed by Solomon. And then as the man smelled it, he drew out the demon through his nostrils. And when the man at once fell down, he adjured the demon never to come back into him, speaking Solomon's name and reciting the incantations which he had composed. Then wishing to convince the bystanders and prove to them that he had this power, Eleazar placed a cup or a foot basin full of water a little way off and commanded the demon as it went out of the man to overturn it and make known to the spectators that he had left the man. See, the people were accustomed to the use of magical formulas by the Jewish exorcists. You can read about this. You know that it happened in Matthew chapter 12, verse 27, and Acts chapter 9, verse 13. We can read in there that there were exorcists in the time of Jesus, and they failed. They incantations and spells, all that stuff means nothing. Because when Jesus says words with authority, his commandment will make the demons flee. Very simple. Be quiet and come out of him. Right after he did this, this young man was thrown into convulsions and the unclean spirit cried out, came out of him with a loud voice And they were all amazed. Remember, this was on the Sabbath. That was a no-no to heal on the Sabbath. It was on the Sabbath in a synagogue in Capernaum. They were all amazed, the board says. So they debated among themselves saying, what is this? What is this new teaching with authority? Again, they recognized that Jesus had authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. They were amazed, not only at his words, but at his actions. And immediately, there's that word again, immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding districts of Galilee. 
Remember, all those people that were in that area, you have to understand, good news travels fast. It says then, and immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. I can tell you, uh, Francis Chan talks about Jesus's house, or excuse me, Peter's house was just down the street. It was. We're talking five to ten paces outside the door of the synagogue, and you're at Peter's house. And it says, immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came to the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. They entered the house of Simon, who is Peter and Andrew. Jesus came to this humble house in Capernaum, and there he met a sick woman. Peter's mother-in-law was ill. Jesus didn't just perform for the crowds in the synagogue. That's not what he was doing anyway. He wasn't performing. Here we see that Jesus ministered to one specific person in a private setting, in a private home. Jesus's interest was in meeting the needs of individuals and not promoting himself. He humbled himself and took of himself no reputation. He wasn't looking for praise and adulation. He came to preach the kingdom of God is at hand. So Jesus was not promoting himself. So we see what he did in the synagogue in a public display. He didn't do that to get attention. He did that because there was an individual in need of healing, in need of being set free. And then he came to Peter's house and his mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law was ill. So out of compassion, Jesus healed her. He didn't need the power of the crowd, the dynamics that come with that to help his ministry. He just wanted to minister to Peter's mother. It says, Now Simon's mother-in-law was laying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. See, in healing Peter's mother-in-law, Jesus showed simplicity with his power. He healed with the same authority that he used to cast out demons, but this was the simplicity of meeting someone right where they're at. She was suffering, Peter's mother, what the Talmud calls um, a burning fever, a burning fever. Um, it was and still is a very prevalent thing along that particular part of Galilee. It still exists today. Uh, the Talmud, which is a Jewish book, um, actually lays down the methods of dealing with it. Um, it's ridiculous what they tell you to do. Um, you can find things in Exodus 3, in the book of Exodus um, it, it, 3, verse 2, 3, 4, and 5. Um, you'll find some information on how um, you could heal yourself through... Um, of this burning fever. Um, then they also had a certain magical formula that was pronounced and, and then this cure was supposed to be achieved. Again, we see that their tradition was to use magic. Jesus completely disregarded all the paraphernalia of popular magic and with a gesture and with a word of unique authority and power, he healed this woman. He doesn't need anything except the word, the willingness and the word. Such power and authority. And it says, after he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand and the fever left her, she waited on them. Hmm. Peter's mother-in-law responded the way we should when Jesus blesses us. She immediately began to serve out of gratitude. When Jesus blesses you, when Jesus blesses me, what do we do? What is our reaction? Do we bless others because he has blessed us? Do we bless Jesus for what he has done for us? What do we do when Jesus blesses us? The scripture goes on to say, when evening came after the sun had set, they began bringing to him, Jesus, all who were ill and those who were demon possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door. This is interesting. When the sun had set, so the Sabbath day runs from 6 p.m. the night before to 6 p.m. the day of the Sabbath, 6 to 6. So um, when the sun had set, that means after 6 p.m., the Sabbath day was now over. And Jesus was ministering after the sun had set, ending the Sabbath day. Um, free from the Sabbath restrictions on travel and activity, because during the Sabbath, they were not allowed to travel very far or to do a certain amount of things. It was very restrictive. 
So after the Sabbath restrictions were lifted, all the people came out to where Jesus was to be healed. It was a very busy day because it goes on to say the whole city had gathered at the door of Peter's home. The whole city. Earlier, I told you that there were about 15,000 people in these cities. This whole city was gathered at the door to see Jesus. It says, and he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. <laughs> it was a busy day for Jesus. Uh, he ministered after nightfall to the whole city that had gathered at the door of Peter's home. He worked very hard to serve the needs of others. And he always put their needs in front of him. But the next thing we see, it says here, in the early morning while he was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. In the morning, after a long day, because it was after the sun had set, the whole city of Capernaum came to him wanting to be healed. So after the long day, we could certainly excuse Jesus if he wanted to sleep in, right? But he didn't. What we find here is a pattern from Jesus, and we'll see this throughout the rest of the Gospels. Having risen a long time before daylight, so uh, the assumption is daylight came at 6 a.m., um, he made less time for sleep and more time for prayer. This is what Jesus did while everybody else was sleeping because they had had a long day of pushing and pulling and excitement and seeing people healed and then spreading the news and being excited over what Jesus had done. They were tired. They went to sleep. Jesus was spent. He was tired, but he was, what he did in response to all that is he went away to pray in a secluded place. He made less time for sleep and more time for prayer. That's the formula that we should take on today. When you are tired, when you are weary, get with the Lord. He will revive and refresh and, and re, he will revive and refresh you. It said um, that Jesus prayed. He was praying in the solitary place where he went away to. He didn't need to pray because he was weak. That's not why Jesus needed to pray, because he was strong. He was the source of his strength was his relationship with God, his father. That was the source of Jesus' strength and power. Jesus knew that pressure and busyness can drive us toward prayer not from prayer. That's the way it should be. When the world is busy and things are churning and turning and you feel like you have no time to get things done, it should drive you toward prayer, not from prayer. We don't know exactly what Jesus prayed for because the scripture doesn't tell us, but as much as anything, Jesus used this time of prayer for that close, intimate communion with God. You don't have to say anything when you spend time with God. You just need to be in his presence. He understands what you're going through. You don't even have to say anything because he already knows. But he wants to hear from you. He wants to hear your voice. He's a good father. One of the things we can probably uh, think about what Jesus prayed for, because he was in this communion with God, um, maybe he prayed for himself. He needed strength. He needed to have the will to do what God had sent him to do. Even then, Jesus knew that his time was nearing. Maybe he prayed for his disciples because he knew what they were going to have to go through for strength to understand and to thrive in what Jesus was getting ready to do. Maybe he prayed for those he met and ministered to that previous night. Maybe he prayed for them. Maybe he prayed for those he would meet and minister that were coming his way. Maybe. He prayed for you. See, Jesus knew the importance of a solitary time with God. While it's good and important for us to join together with others like we do on Sunday mornings, Wednesdays, whatever time you have with others, maybe you have a Bible study or just get together for some fellowship. That's important. That is very important, but there's so much more that you can learn and experience when you are in a solitary place with just God. You know, when you're trying to heal your marriage, you don't spend time with everybody else. You spend time with the person that you made that vow to. The only way you're going to get to know that person is to spend time with them. The only way you're going to get to know the grace and the love and the character of God 
is to spend time with him. Good disciples spend time with their teacher. This tells us a lot of things about Jesus' prayer life. Um, for Jesus, fellowship with God was something more than just the Sabbath day. It's more than just coming to church on Sunday or Wednesday. Fellowship with God is an everyday, constant thing. Jesus wanted to be alone to pray, not with other people around. People don't need to hear your fantastic prayers. He just wants to hear from your heart. They don't have to be fancy words. He just wants to hear from your heart. I spend time talking to the Lord as if he was sitting right at the chair next to me. I talk to him when I'm in the car. Wow, Lord, that tree was beautiful. You do beautiful work, God. Wow, Lord, did you see that little girl? My heart breaks for her. She has no coat on and she's outside. Lord, what can I do for you today? Oh, Father, my stomach is growling. I need to stop and get something to eat. I am constantly talking to the Lord because he is always with me. He knows everything about me anyway. I'm just expressing my love for him when I'm talking to him, just like I would if my children or your spouse or somebody that you love is sitting in the seat next to you. I talk to God all the time. Jesus wanted to be alone to pray because that's when you can pray the most intimate prayers. And he wanted to be able to pour out his heart to his father with no one else around. Get alone with God. It will change many things for you. It goes on to say that Simon and his companions searched for Jesus and they found him and they said to Jesus, everyone is looking for you. Wow, this is an important thing to get down. They searched for Jesus. This was early in his ministry. So they did not know the pattern that Jesus had of getting away to a quiet place in the early morning hours and talking to God. This was the first time they had experienced it. So they didn't know where he was. So they searched for Jesus. Is that what we need to do? We need to search for Jesus. When we don't see him or we don't feel him or we feel as if we're getting distance from him, you want to be more intimate with Jesus, search for him. Seek and you will find. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek the Lord. Look for Jesus. As they got to know Jesus, these disciples knew that when they couldn't find him, he was probably off in a solitary place praying. It happens over and over again. But they said, everyone is looking for you. You know why? They probably thought that Jesus was excited and pleased. He's popular. He should be excited about that. And that he would want to spend more time with the crowd because, oh, they just adored him. So that's what people like. They like that attention. Even today, you sing a song and people want to just bombard you with compliments. Oh, you want to bask in that beauty. Um, American Idol, uh, The Voice, you know, everybody's just... They're giving you all kinds of accolades and some people just love that. And there's a time and place for that. I'm not saying that's bad, but that's not what Jesus was about. He wasn't searching for adulation. He didn't want to be popular. He wanted them to understand the kingdom of God was at hand. So the disciples had the wrong impression of what Jesus was looking for. And that's okay. Because as they got to know him, they knew better. Right now, they're in an infancy in their relationship with Christ. And that'll happen to each and every one of us. If you're new in your relationship for Christ, you might think something is the right way. You might think Jesus is doing this. But as you get to know him more, you get to know his character more, you'll understand a little bit more about what Jesus is trying to tell you. It's a process. And that is a beautiful thing with God. But here's what Jesus said. He said to them, when they said, everyone's looking for you, Jesus said to them, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. The clear emphasis here was that Jesus did not plan to ride the crest of his popularity there in Capernaum. He knew his ministry was to preach all across Galilee, that huge area that we talked about. His ministry was not about being famous or enjoying the fame. His ministry, he says it clearly, for this purpose I have come. He says here, let's go somewhere else, the towns nearby, for that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. Way back when we first started here in verse 15, it says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus came to preach 
the good news. His purpose was not to sit in adulation and have people praising him. And had he stayed, he likely would have never been able to leave. The throngs would have kept pressing in and pressing in. What more could he do for them? It says he healed many of them, but so many more were needing the hands of Jesus. His clear emphasis was on what his purpose was. I have come to preach the kingdom of God. See, the healing and the miraculous ministry of Jesus was impressive and glorious, but it was never his emphasis. And then we come to the story of the leper. It says, and he went into their synagogues throughout all of Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. Do you understand when I told you last week that this area was one of the most unspiritual areas of the nation? He went around casting out all the demons. Wow. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before Jesus, saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Let's talk about leprosy. It was one of the most horrific diseases in the ancient world. Today, leprosy still affects about 15 million across the world, mostly in third world nations. Yes, leprosy still exists. You have to understand the horror of what leprosy is. It begins as small spots on the skin. And before too long, those spots get bigger and they start to turn white and they get shiny or scaly in appearance. And the spots soon start to spread all over the body. Then the hair starts to fall out. Even the eyebrows, they fall out, the hair. And as it gets worse and progresses, the fingernails and toenails start to come loose and they fall off, they rot. And then the joints of your fingers and toes begin to rot and fall off. It's a disgusting, horrible thing to think that piece by piece, your body is rotting and falling off. Your gums begin to shrink and your teeth fall out. Leprosy keeps eating away at the face until the nose, the palate, and even the eyes rot and the leper wastes away until he or she dies. Leprosy is a horrible disease. And this leper came to Jesus. Because the horror is not just the disease. The worst part of having leprosy is the way people treated them. They were so alone. In the Old Testament, God said that when there were lepers among the people, Israel, they should carefully quarantine them and be examined. Lepers had to dress like people who were in mourning for the dead because they were considered to be the living dead. Hey, Marissa, if you're watching this, here's a story of the living dead. They had to warn the people around them. When a leper came in contact, they had to warn them around them by crying out, unclean, unclean. Do you remember that little thing that Pastor Bill did when the 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 toy fell from the um, the the ceiling of the church and he asked someone to bring the, the garbage can forward. And when uh, he was leaving with it, he yelled, unclean, unclean. Well, he was getting that from here. When a leper came around people, they had to yell, unclean, unclean. It was so that people didn't get near them. This wasn't because it was highly contagious. It was because God used this disease as an example of sin. And its effect on us. Little by little, your body starts, your soul starts to rot. Leprosy is the perfect thing to show how sin is uh, dealt with in your life. And the people of this time when Jesus was alive went further than the Old Testament told them to. Because back then, they thought two things about a leper. Number one, you're the walking dead. And number two, you deserve this punishment that God has given you. Leprosy, they felt they deserved it. It was a punishment of God. Jewish custom, custom, not the law. Jewish custom said you couldn't even greet a leper. It said you had to stand six feet away. Boy, that's familiar today, isn't it? You have to stand six feet away from people. But their custom said you can't greet them and you have to stand six feet away from a leper. That's a lot of isolation. But knowing how terrible this disease was, it does not surprise us how desperate this leper was when he approached Jesus. He must have known about Jesus. He must have. He just got through healing all kinds of people around Capernaum. He was casting out demons. And this leper came to Jesus, beseeching him 
and falling on his knees before him. There was no six feet of distance saying to Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Do you notice here? He didn't say you can heal me. He said, you can make me clean. This leper believed the power of Jesus and had confidence that Jesus could take care of him. This shows that the leper had great faith because as far as we know, Jesus had not yelled. He had not yet healed a leper in his ministry. And that day, they all knew that only God could heal a leper. There was no cure and no one ever got better. A leper could never get better without a direct healing from God. And this leper knew what he needed from Jesus. He didn't ask to be healed. He asked to be cleansed. The leper needed much more than healing. Don't we? We need to be cleansed. And when you're cleansed, you are healed. Whatever you think you need from God, what you need most from Jesus is healing. To be cleansed from sin and a life lived for self. Cleansing. So what does Jesus do? <laughs> he cleansed him. It says, moved with compassion. That's the Jesus we all know. We are often moved with compassion when we meet sick people. But lepers didn't usually arouse compassion. Their whole appearance was just too repulsive. This man's whole body and his life was rotting. The smell, the way he looked, it was repulsive. Hmm. Most people didn't have compassion. But here it says, Jesus was moved with compassion and he stretched out his hand. Do you see how different this was. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. Jesus touched this leper. See, Jesus healed people in many different ways, but here he chose to heal this man with a touch. Jesus could have spoken a word or he could have thought a thought and it would have healed this leper, <laughs> but he didn't do that. He did the one thing that this man had not had for a long time. He touched him. This is important because people were forbidden to touch a leper. Since his disease was in the advanced stages, he, was a, he must have been a leper for a long time. So it had been a long time before he felt a loving touch. Remember, it was against Jewish ceremonial law to touch a leper. So when Jesus did the one thing that they least expected of him, he reached out and he touched him. And these words are so beautiful. Jesus said to this leper, I am willing, be cleansed, not be healed, be cleansed. And then Jesus told this leper, this former leper now, he was no longer a leper, to go to the priests to carry out the ceremonial law required when a leper was cleansed. This is important. I want you to catch this. Jesus did this, number one, to honor the law of God, because that's what the law of God said. Not the law of Moses, the law of God. But it was also a testimony to the priest that an incurable de disease had been cured. It was a message. Uh, the, you have to understand the elements used in the ceremonial clean, cleaning of a leper. Um, it was cedar wood, um, hyssop, and scarlet. These are the same elements used when cleansing someone who had defiled, who had been defiled by a dead body. You can read about that in Numbers chapter 19 and Leviticus chapter 14. There is a ceremonial cleansing ritual. So um, if you were a Jewish person and you touched a dead body, you had to go through the ceremonial cleansing. If you were a leper, remember, a leper was the walking dead you had to go through the same ceremonial cleansing as if you had touched a dead body. And since lepers had never been healed, these priests had never conducted a ceremony for the healing of a leper. So when they had to look up this procedure for the ceremony and had to carry it out for the first time, it would have been a witness that the Messiah was among them. Jesus did this with intent. When he said, go and show yourself to the priests, and offer your cleansing, what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Did you miss that the first time? It was a testimony to the priests because no one had ever been cleansed 
as a leper. And the only time they knew that a leper could be cleansed, it had to come directly from God. So Jesus, by sending the leper to the priest for cleansing, was announcing to the world, I am Messiah. Hmm. But this is what happened. But he, the leper, went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in unpopulated areas. And they were coming to him from everywhere. When Jesus said, say nothing to anyone, and the man decided instead to go out and proclaim it freely, don't, don't judge this man. He was disobedient to what Jesus had said. But how would you feel? You'd been a leper. People didn't touch you. You hadn't had human touch in years. You were rotting and filthy and you were wearing filthy clothes and, and your body stunk and you were near death and Jesus cleansed you. Wouldn't you be excited and go out and tell people? I don't think I could contain it. I would want to tell everybody. So this man may have meant well. And he thought he was helping Jesus. He was exciting. But the disobedience in not doing what Jesus said hindered, in some ways, the ministry of Jesus. Now, it was all by design. But what it said here is because of the fame of what Jesus had done, no one had ever been healed of leprosy. We read the story of Moses' sister when God showed her, you know, her hand went in and she, she had leprosy and God healed her. But it was healed directly by God. Here, no one could heal a leper other than by God. So it was a message. No one had ever seen a leper being cleaned. Hmm. So imagine how many people wanted to come to Jesus. Jesus could no longer openly enter the city. So it's best to always obey Jesus. And we should never think that we have a better plan than him.